I don't get it. Wally keeps trying to grapple monsters. I came here to bust heads, not cuddle and hug skeletons. Like, get that necrophiliac crap out of here, bruh. He's playing Gorgak the Smellable, Dwarf Barbarian, not Randy Savage. Why the hell would you ever use grapple in combat? Hey yo, John here, and welcome back to Stupid Tabletop, presented by Malareth's Weapon. Today we're going to look at more things that may not make sense to people that play tabletop RPGs. Today's topic is actions other than attacks and damaging spells in D&D. A lot of players, especially the newer ones, don't do a whole lot in combat that doesn't directly impact hit points. It's understandable. The search for gratification leads them to roll a d20, seeking that elusive crit that would make the goblin's head explode like a watermelon under the hammer of an 80s comedian. Or they want the whole table to immediately see the results of their prowess in the magic arts, calling a spike of ice to impale the threat before it can do further damage. D&D is a numbers game, and the fewer opponent turns there are, the better. Why shouldn't you be the one to take that skeleton mini off the map? Without any other context, there's no reason why. You should always take the best opportunity you have in battle, but it's also important to realize the routes you have that don't involve checking off your highest level spell in the first room of the dungeon, or rolling that disadvantaged attack. First, let's talk about disengage. The idea of tucking tail and losing a whole turn just to get out of the line of fire isn't anyone's idea of a spectacular time. In fact, it's probably just above being dead or paralyzed for the whole fight. With that said, it's still above being dead or paralyzed for the whole fight, and sometimes a little time can go a long way. One more turn for the fighter to wail on the monster's head, one more chance for the rogue to actually get the kill, one more chance for the cleric to buff the fighter instead of trying to heal you. You don't even need to be already injured for disengaging to be the best choice. If your 10 hit point, 11 armor class, glass cannon wizard gets jumped on the back line by a dire toad, it's probably a better option to bug out than get swallowed like a fly. Everyone knows the last thing you want to see happen to the map is the glass cannon wizard or healer to be taken off of it. With strategic disengages, that's the neat part. You don't. Another thing I love to see in any tabletop battle is the battlefield itself playing a role. Trees can serve as a slight nerf for overused ranged abilities. The GM can up the stakes by having a cliffside. A ship-to-ship -ship battle can provide the option of pushing an opponent overboard or messing with planned player tactics by moving tokens against their will. This doesn't have to be early colonial, two lines clash and the winner moves on kind of stuff. Keeping the fights from being formulaic and mad can be done, and it's not something that falls solely on the GM to ensure. Everyone at the table bears a certain amount of weight to carry a campaign that's fun, fulfilling, and fruitful for all involved. D&D really is a team endeavor. Whether you look at it as a series of combat encounters, a storytelling tool, a roleplay avenue, or some unholy combination of the three, that doesn't matter. The important thing is, your group and DM have to do it as a team. If you're not a player that enjoys tactical gaming, encounters can feel a little boring and humdrum. The fact is, D&D fighting doesn't have to be a series of roles. You can use the mechanics and build a fight that works like a Hollywood superhero team-up movie ruckus. All you need is a little creativity and a willingness to not necessarily be the star. Think about a spell like Grease. Slick Grease covers the ground in a 10-foot square centered on a point within range and turns it into difficult terrain for the duration. When the Grease appears, each creature standing in its area must succeed on a dexterity saving throw or fall prone. A creature that enters the area or ends its turn there must also succeed on a dexterity saving throw or fall prone. Now, this spell description on its own may not sound like it's a riot, quiet or otherwise. However, in the Oxventure D&D series, Corazon, played by Andy Ferrant, Merowyn, played by Ellen Rose, and literally everyone else in the world are the GM, played by Johnny Chiodini, combined Corazon's grease with Merowyn's spike growth during an incident referred to as Merowyn's Meat Grinder Forevermore. The result almost immediately incapacitated all opponents, and ended the fight in one turn. While the interpretation of rules by the GM was not strictly by the book, the Ox Venture is a rather silly affair after all. Altogether, the players and GM came together and made an epic encounter by thinking outside of the attack role versus armor class box. 
The players took it upon themselves to make their arena more interesting, and in doing so, amped up the impression that a short encounter made on everyone at the table. One of our own family campaigns saw a rogue throw ball bearings into the Warlock's Force spell, basically making a legendary metal hailstorm to assault the enemies. It was like a goddamn Eldritch shotgun. This wasn't an example of a team adding hazards and capitalizing, but using coordination in a slightly different way. Sure, the rogue could have waltzed up to one bad guy, buried her rapier deep into his back, and rolled 294 sneak attack d6s to add before using her bonus action to disengage and remain unscathed. Most people in our group wouldn't be able to remember a single other time the rogue or warlock attacked in that game, but we will never forget the ball bearings and the Eldritch Blast trick. I'd take a compelling narrative battle over a bland tactical confrontation any day of the week. So why would a player choose to have their character grapple an enemy rather than bringing to bear their 1d12 acts of raffle snopping? Let's talk a bit about what a grapple can actually do. Grappling is a way for the player to gain control that they would not normally have in a fight. The player spins an action, makes a special melee attack that can be done on its own, or replace one of your attacks if you have multiple. It boils down to a player making an athletics check against an opponent's athletics or acrobatics check. A lot of monsters are going to have lower athletics than a player. Simply enough, right? I already know that. I read the book and we go through the process every time Wally or, or Gorgak sees a monster that doesn't look too big or too strong to wrap his arms around. I still don't understand why he does it. Well, the answer may surprise you. There are actually a few advantages to be gained from having more control in a combat situation, and grapple is an easy route to an opponent being in the wrong place at the wrong time. An opponent that thrives on hit and run tactics has a lower chance to hit, and no chance to run if they try for a hit. They can break the grapple, but that's going to use their action. Most of you may know a silent spell keeps anyone in the area from casting spells with verbal components. What happens when you cast it on the bad guy? They're going to look at their spell list and see what they have to work with in the somatic column. The party member casts silence on the GM's prize caster Big Bad, and the GM already has a plan for that. They're going to use Steel Wind Strike in the silence to hit five creatures with 6d10, and then teleport to one of them who is out of the silence for more shenanigans. Imagine the look on the GM's face when their grand plan gets bear hugged out of existence by a huge zero intelligence character that may or may not mistake dog poop for chocolate pastries on the red. A hero can use a grapple to move an opponent, though slowly, to capitalize on one of those battlefield hazards we discussed earlier. Druid has a bonfire up? Get your local himbo fighter or Amazon barbarian to lock up with the nearest baddie and take him to the oven. Nobody in the warlock's cloud of daggers getting a little too close of a shave? Take somebody to get cleaned up. Did the zombie not take your advice to take a long walk off a short pier? Do what you did in middle school, just push them in. Let's say you are just two lines of soldiers in a field rushing to one another a la Hollywood medieval battles. No cliffside, no hazards, no offensive zones laid out yet. You've grappled your opponent, they've failed the escape action, what do you do now? Shove them. It doesn't require you to break the grapple, as you don't have to have a free hand, and they don't move out of your range. You now have one enemy prone, taking advantage attack rolls from anything within 5 feet, and they even have to actually break the grapple to stand up. Grappling is a player choosing to use a character to give an opportunity for someone else to be the star. It's like the sinner throwing up an alley-oop. Sure, he could post up and drive to the hole, but nothing gets the crowd into it like an alley-oop. It's unselfish, great table manners, and if there were a D&D version of SportsCenter, you'd both be in the top 10 for the night. If we take a step back and examine it logically, doing things other than attacking in combat is sometimes tactically the best option. In other times, it just makes a better narrative. If you're confused about why a player has chosen a certain course of action, try to examine it from their point of view. Are they about to die? Are they tossing you the ball for the boom shakalaka highlight reel throwdown jam of the night? Whether it's a lonely puddle of grease, a raging bonfire, or a burly hug fest on the front lines, make sure you don't miss your cue to make the chronicle of your party a little more badass. That's all for this episode. Feel free to check out our other videos, roll a critical on that like button if we've earned it, or join our backstory by clicking subscribe. If you have any questions, suggestions, or criticisms, feel free to leave them in the comments below. 
If you're interested in watching some actual plays, our family group does Call of Cthulhu on Twitch, Monday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern, with the video going up to YouTube on Wednesday. Check us out if you have time, or if you just want to know, how does Call of Cthulhu work? It's not D&D, but it's cool. Anyhow, see you next time. Bye!